Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features the Uncanny X-Men number 172, cover dated August 1983. So this is quite a striking, designy cover by Paul Smith, featuring the wedding invitation to Logan and Mariko Yashida's wedding in Japan. And uh, there's the funny little note here to Nightcrawler, hey elf, don't forget the beer, W. And we've got a nice uh, tone in the background here for uh, the canvas on which the invitation is lying. And of course, most strikingly, we've got this hilt of a samurai sword that is practically all the way through Wolverine's heart. Um, so the invitation itself is actually not Paul Smith's design. Rather, he's picking up on where this story picks up from and that is the end of the 1982 Chris Claremont and Frank Miller Wolverine uh, four-issue miniseries. So I'm just going to show you the last page from the miniseries um, in a trade paperback collection. And it is here. You can see the last panel there. You can see Kitty opening up the invitation. We've got all the text there lettered by Tom Orzakowski here and on the Paul Smith cover. But you can see the slight difference there in terms of some of the choices that uh, Paul Smith has made to enhance the image. So we've got these ribbons here, rather than these um, board, uh, borders uh, to the uh, photo, uh, like keeping the picture of Logan and Mariko um, in the invitation. Uh, but pretty nice, picking up on, as I said, Miller's art, but doing his own version of it here um, on the cover. And also, in addition to that, um, you are going to see, when I open this one up to the, uh, uh, the opening page, we're going to see an interesting uh, layout design choice by Paul Smith, and that is that he follows up on the aesthetic of the Wolverine limited series, where I'll show you again a few pages uh, from the Wolverine miniseries where you've got, for example, a vertical panel and you've got a layout then of horizontal panels to the side. Uh, here we've got the vertical panels here. Flip on a little further. Yeah, and we've got these horizontal panels down the page as well. So let's see any other good examples of that, especially yeah, when Wolverine is fighting these uh, hand ninjas here. And of course the classic denouement. Uh, of the fight between Wolverine and Mariko's father, Shingen, the horizontal panels. So we will see Paul Smith imitating that in this issue. So the story opens in Tokyo, this horizontal panel here establishing uh, the Tokyo cityscape at night. Definitely this is uh, um, a photocopy of a photograph, uh, but nicely done. And we have a narration here. It turns out to be first person narration by Wolverine. The upper class Maguro district of Tokyo. The building stands 60 stories tall, this one here. Uh, 55 commercial, the rest a single luxury apartment. It's where the daimyo of clan Yashida stays whenever he's in town. 10 weeks ago, upon Yashida Shingen's death, and that's Wolverine killed him, the title passed to his firstborn, his daughter Mariko. I'm her lover, her champion, and in five days I become her consort. A man should have his friends beside him at his wedding. These are mine, the X-Men, and so here they all arrive. Really, really nicely drawn and rendered by Paul Smith. Um, every single one of these X-Men characters has a distinctive look, and um, it's nicely uh, realized by Smith and his inker, Bob Wyacek. So, uh, Peter Rasputin, Colossus is the first to uh, call out to Wolverine. It's good to see you. We've been too long apart. And I like the way that we've got the height differential here. Like Peter's well over six foot. Wolverine down around five foot two or something like that. Nicely done. We've got Storm coming in at the back. Uh, Kitty there looking delighted. And she's got Lockheed peeping around on her shoulder. And I really like the way that Mariko is drawn here in um, traditional Japanese costume. Same with uh, Logan himself and the bonsai tree um, here in the foreground. Really nicely done. Nice attention to detail 
Nightcrawler carrying up and dropping off uh, the suitcases there. And then this is wonderful art. And again, this is really where you begin to see Paul Smith imitating, uh, but doing it in his own fashion and way. Uh, uh, Miller's layouts and design features of the Wolverine miniseries. So we've got the reunion here between Nightcrawler and Wolverine, these characters particularly close. Mariko silently watching there in the background. And we have Wolverine's first encounter with Lockheed. Lockheed's a bit suspicious of Wolverine. And um, Kitty here, this is a really nice uh, face for Kitty and uh, Lockheed peeping around her shoulder. They didn't say a word about Lockheed in customs. And Lockheed isn't a pet, he's my friend. Don't you dare snarl Lockheed, she says to him. Wolverine's my friend too. And I like this uh, panel here with Wolverine um, half closing his eyes and scrutinizing the dragon. Feisty little critter, ain't he? Reminds me of me. So Mariko then speaks up and says, Logan Sam, one of the X-Men remains in the Genkin. Will you not invite her in? And uh, first person narration continues. I'm a mutant, just like all the X-Men born with special unique powers and abilities. In my case, among other things, I have enhanced physical senses, sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell. I knew who was there at the instant she entered. And here it is, it is Rogue. So a nice paralleling here of uh, host and guest and a rather uh, shy, uh, guess too and you can almost see like rogue here like very doubtful about uh, the kind of welcome she's going to receive great command of body language here and again the contrast between Mariko's kind of welcoming language body language and then rogue's hesitancy and doubtfulness here and her um, baggage as well um, off the plane great attention to detail love the grain the wood grain here detail on the side of the door, uh, the screen tone here indicating the shadow in the background, the light going out onto uh, the back wall here, uh, the curtains here, like just really well done. And Wolverine's uh, first person narration continues. The kid's name is Rogue. We tussled a while back at the Pentagon and before that she nearly killed a good friend of mine. I don't mind being used as a punching bag, comes with the territory, but what she did to Carol Danvers I'll never forget or forgive. And Rogue joined the X-Men in the previous issue, 171. There's a review of that issue on the channel already, so do check that out if you're unfamiliar with it. Uh, but this is the first that Wolverine's learning that Rogue has been um, accepted into the team. And Storm makes the point, Logan, she's no longer our enemy. Professor Xavier has accepted her as an X-Man. Wolverine asks as he's being held back by Nightcrawler. You agree to that, Aurora? We all did. Figures, he says. Any outfit that will take me as a member, it'll admit anyone. Um, kind of a version of uh, Groucho Marx's uh, remark about um, a club, that he wouldn't be a member of any club that would accept him as a member. A little uh, variation on that here. And Mariko puts her hand on his shoulder and uh, she makes a very sensible point. You think too little of yourself, Wolverine, and I think judge your comrades too harshly. Whatever your feelings, she is our guest and as such will be treated with all due courtesy and respect. Welcome, Rogue San, and may your stay with us be a happy one. Thank you, Lady Mariko, she says uh, very courteously here. This is really nice. And again, the wood grain on the door in the background. Really, really great attention to detail. So simple, the line work, but so perfect. Um, the costumes, the hair, Mariko's hair, everything so well delineated. And then we've got this outside shot on the apartment window with the X-Men here at an angle, all on the perfect planes of um, perspective and the tip of a samurai sword blade. So Wolverine tells them to make themselves comfortable. There are refreshments if you want them or beds if you want to crash. And Kitty says, great idea. What, did, what day is this anyway? Did we gain or lose one crossing the international date line? Um, last time the X-Men were in Japan was Uncanny X-Men 118 and 19, back in the John Byrne uh, art era. So here we are outside and we have finally our title for the story, Scarlet in Glory and our creative team. Chris Claremont, writer, Paul Smith, penciler, Bob Wyacek, inker, Glynis Wine, colorist, and Tom Orzakowski, letterer. And this is the era when Louise Jones, uh, later on Simonson, 
uh, was editor of the book and an editor that Claremont loved to work with, likewise, uh, subsequently Anne Nocenti. So who is this here? It's the Silver Samurai and he thinks here, the bugs I planted work perfectly. I can hear every word said across the way. The X-Men are exhausted from their journey and they expect no trouble. Why should they? A wedding is a joyous occasion. If I strike tonight, there will be easy prey. But here in the background, if we pay attention, someone is watching him, a figure is watching him, and it turns out to be Yukio, uh, a character first seen in the Wolverine miniseries. And she thinks, you've been on Wolverine's trail for days, Skulker. If he weren't so besotted with that bloodless porcelain doll, that's Mariko, he'd have spotted you long ago. Luckily for him, less so for you, he has nothing to fear so long as I'm around. So she leaps off the top of the building, down towards Silver Samurai, and boots him from behind. And, um, but she wants him alive for questioning, and says as she strikes at him, gotcha. So he doesn't know who she is, she's right behind him. And Wolverine hears everything from inside the apartment. Nightcrawler, who doesn't have Wolverine's enhanced senses, makes the point he didn't hear anything. But Wolverine's ready to roll. He gets Nightcrawler to teleport him out onto the roof. The same vantage point that um, uh, uh, Yukio had back in this panel. And I've just noticed now the top of the roof is in the form of a rotary telephone. It's an interesting design there. So Wolverine, shirt off, claws popped, uh, works with Nightcrawler here. Grab the lady elf, make sure she's safe. So Nightcrawler uh, ready to uh, fulfill that point, but Wolverine leaps into action. And a great top-down shot to the rooftop and a shot from behind of Wolverine with his back muscles and his claws popped, foreshortening here with his um, stocking feet. Excellent shot, vertical panel here by uh, Paul Smith. So there he is taking on Silver Samurai and uh, he says to Yukio in Japanese, fancy meeting you here, darling. Where else would I be? How about an explanation, he asks. Ask him, not me. He's the villain. And Silver Samurai says, I'll give you the only answer you deserve, Gaijin, as he teleports away. And Wolverine, striking through, falls off the edge of the building. But Nightcrawler is alert and uh, Banff teleports him down to the ground. Or no, back up uh, to the top of the building by this... Uh, uh, telephone uh, structure and then Yukio's gone the woman she's gone says Nightcrawler and Wolverine explains that's her style pal she's done her good deed for the day elf let her go and Nightcrawler asks about her and Wolverine explains name's Yukio she considers herself a ronin a masterless samurai she's good too almost on a par with me we used to be pause friends and this is very Frank Miller here, the swinging flagpole. You see that many times in uh, Frank Miller's original Daredevil run. Like the color hold here for the building tops in the neon lit Japanese uh, nightscape. Uh, really, really nice coloring and uh, on, on these pages uh, by uh, Glynis Wine. And so Yukio is bouncing around the rooftops, but she slips and she's falling and who she rescued by except for Storm. Uh, who must have uh, left the apartment building as well to reconnoiter the situation with Wolverine and Nightcrawler. So she saves Yukio and then they have a little bit of a chat and uh, basically she knows about Storm because presumably Wolverine has told her all about the X-Men and she says, I know, friend of Logan, so was I and a lot more once. What a ride, one in a million, I loved it. You nearly died, says Storm. That's what made the experience so exquisite. Death holds no terrors for you, asks Storm. Life is the ultimate adventure, Windrider, and death the prize that awaits us all. Since it's inevitable, why worry about it? As she somersaults and tumbles away. She's got that devil-may-care attitude. And um, Storm thinks, but she smiles here as she thinks the woman is mad, and yet I wish I could laugh so. So this is all part of Claremont's ongoing project to... Uh, transform and develop Storm's character away from the uh, goddess uh, version uh, to a more grounded figure or perhaps better to say a rounded figure goddess and street level and that's all coming up 
um, over the next year or so of Uncanny X-Men stories. And then we're back in uh, Mariko's apartment. And interesting the way that um, this is designed here, the layout of where the uh, X-Men are all seated. We've got Rogue here at the, uh, at the, at the well, is it a breakfast bar table? And then the X-Men seated around the sofa. And they look together here with Storm standing apart. And then we'll see shortly something else. So just make a note of that. Now there's a lot of exposition here about uh, like giving a reader who hasn't read maybe the Wolverine miniseries and New Mutants some information on what's going on with these different characters. So I might as well go through that too. So Storm says, I recognize the man, Kenny, Kenny Uchio Harada, the Silver Samurai. He and his mistress Viper fought the New Mutants recently and killed one of them, uh, Karma. Was he following us, Logan, or you? Is there a connection between him and you, him and Mariko? Maybe so, says Wolverine. Mariko's dad, Shingen, used the clan as a power base from which he seized control of the Japanese underworld. He was an ambitious man. I doubt he'd be satisfied with that. He may have been working with Viper to expand his influence worldwide. So the reference to Karma's apparent death here is New Mutants uh, 5 to 7, which featured uh, Silver Samurai and Viper, and also their determination to go after the X-Men in Japan. So... Uh, Colossus asks, can this Shingen person be stopped? This is a nice little scene here. Already done, PD by me, says Wolverine. Great, then we can question him in, in prison, right? And get all the answers we need, says Kitty. I do not think so, Katschken, says Nightcrawler. What do you mean, Fuzzy Elf? Of course we owe, I see, and the significant look here from Colossus, and most particularly from Wolverine. Moments like this, the first person narration caption, I feel sorry for the kid. She, scare, she cares for me, believes in me, but every so often she gets reminded hard that we come from two different worlds and that mine isn't very nice because he killed Shingen. But it's not outright stated here. It's just left implicit. Really nicely handled this scene. And then the bottom tier of vertical panels, we've got Mariko who's gone off by herself and thinks, in honor, Logan did what I myself would have had to do, faced my father in single combat to the death. Shingen disgraced his family, oh, sorry, his name, his family. He deserved his fate. Would that his death had brought an end to my nightmare as she sheds a tear and uh, lets a note slip from her hand. Meeting tonight, midnight, come alone, Harada. So that's Silver Samurai. I've told no one of this summons, especially not my beloved. I am Lord of Clan Yashida, and there's the honor sword of the clan. It falls to me to atone for my father's crimes. So she uh, uh, um, tips the uh, gong here, and in comes her uh, maidservant, Tony. And she tells her, I will be out a while, Logan, uh, while Logan Sama and our guests are not to know. A nice little color design, color hold design pattern on Tony's um, uh, traditional costume here as well. A nice cast shadow from the window here over Mariko and the honor sword and sigil of clan Yoshida. Nice detail in these panels. So let's continue. And then we have Tony going to Mariko, uh, or no, she's uh, told Wolverine that Mariko's gone to bed. And this is Wolverine's first person caption. And he says, I wish I could join her, but the X-Men and I have too much to talk about. I send Tony to the kitchen for more eats. Jet lag evidently hasn't affected anyone's appetite, but she's knocked out here by none other than Vico, Vi Viper, rather. And she heads into the kitchen where the teapot is steaming and the porcelain cups of tea are arrayed on the tray. So what's going on there? And remember what I said earlier about the angle we saw with the X-Men together in the apartment, Rogue here and the other X-Men, but here we see how far apart she is from them. So continuing this visual uh, uh, implication of Rogue's not being part of the core team just yet sitting apart from them. So Viper comes in, well, 
yes, it's Viper in disguise comes in to serve the tea and Wolverine um, goes over with a couple of uh, cups, one for him, one for Storm, who's also standing apart from the team. So we got this nice little heart to heart between um, Storm and Wolverine here where he says, you're, you're different, Aroro, even as Viper here in this silent panel looks uh, wickedly at uh, Wolverine and Storm before exiting. You're different, Roro. So are you, my friend, she says as she smiles. We've got the poison tea in the foreground. That for sure, whatever road I figured my life would take, I didn't count on it leading here. Look at me, a roughneck Canadian mountain man about to marry the daughter of one of the oldest, most powerful, most respected families in Japan. I still don't believe it's really happening. This has got to be a dream. And of course, Mariko and Wolverine are uh, total opposites. It's a, it's a complete case of opposites attracting um, in, in their love story. And Storm asks why, and he says, because part of me doesn't think it's right. To shame me, Shingen asked me if I was worthy. I guess deep down inside, I still have doubts about the answer. And Storm uh, rejoins, if Mariko accepts you, what else matters? But I sense deeper concern, Logan. And he says, yeah, the clan's involvement in criminal affairs, thanks to Shingen, is far more extensive than Mariko suspects. Those ties won't be easy to sever. And he says here, I feel so flame and helpless. This kind of scrap's too subtle for me. I don't know how to handle it. So... The tea, the poison tea, is uh, drunk by Wolverine, and he suddenly gets it. Strange, the tea shouldn't have that aftertaste, so faint I barely no noticed. And Storm, unawares, continues saying, I wish my own conflict were as clear cut, because Storm is going through some changes as well, having battled uh, Callisto for leadership of the Morlocks and winning. Storm, don't drink, Wolverine warns. And she drops, he knocks the poison tea out of her hand, just as everyone else in the room has collapsed. And a really nice top-down shot here as well. And Mariko, meanwhile, has left in uh, the building. And she is taking this limousine outside the apartment building. And slips a note to the driver with the address. But who does the driver turn out to be? It is Yukio again. Gotcha, she thinks. So what game is Yukio playing? Well, first of all, we have a little interlude in Anchorage and uh, the International Airport of Alaska, home and headquarters of North Star Airlines. And here we've got a nice little design of their logo. Here in whose offices, long after hours is Scott Summers, grandson of the boss, Storm's predecessor as leader of the X-Men. And here he's studying a file and um, Alex, his brother, arrives. Burning the midnight oil, big brother, he asks. Hi, Alex, what brings you here? Filing cabinets open. The drawer that's open is personnel H2P. And whose file is he looking at? Except someone whose surname begins with P, Madeline Pryors. And uh, Scott says to Alex, this is none of your business. Scott, Jean Grey's dead, says Alex. I like the silhouette here. Madeline Pryor bears an uncanny resemblance to her, but that's all. I want to believe that, Alex, but things keep happening. From the moment we met, she and I behaved like people who'd known each other intimately for years. On our first date, she offered to fix my favorite breakfast. When I asked how she knew what it was, she said, simple, I read minds. It's an expression, Scott. She could have found out from grandma. What about her crush? Scott, you two are beautiful together. Why are you trying to destroy it? Asks Alex in incomprehension. I have to know the truth, Alex, whatever the cost. Madeline was the sole survivor of our survivor of a plane that crashed not only on the day Jean died and we knew that but at the exact same moment so therein lies a mystery what is the connection if any between Madeline Pryor and Jean Grey and Phoenix as well and so then we go back to Tokyo and the waterfront and here we have Mariko uh, having that meeting with Harada, Silver Samurai, Viper's there, and then there is an arbitrator, and that is Nabatone Yaku or Yokuze. And uh, Mariko says here, even I have heard of the grand Oyabun of the Yakuza, the sole rival crime lord my father spared. 
However, my presence is solely out of the little respect owed to my half-brother as a sibling. And so this is the first time that we learn that Silver Samurai is uh, Mariko's half-brother and the son of Shingen. And she says to him that I rule clan Yoshida and will do so till I die. And he says that can be arranged. But uh, Nabatone says to be silent. And the uh, dialogue continues where they're in disagreement. Uh, Silver Samurai making the point that he's Shingen's only son. He promised me the clan. He says it is mine by right. And then we see here, because we've just been seeing Mariko in the distance from behind, and now we see her eye and cheekbone, and this is not Mariko's face. So who is it? And I like this white uh, uh, silhouette here. We're still looking from behind. We're not seeing her fully. And um, she says, your claim is denied. So he draws his sword, and she asks the arbitrator that she was... she protests that she was guaranteed safe conduct and he says with a smile on his face and his hands clasped in glee I made my pledge to Lady Mariko you are not she so this shocks Silver Samurai and Viper and who is it it is Yukio once again and um, she uh, takes on Silver Samurai picking up the fight from earlier so uh, Samurai sends, uh, or rather, Viper realizes that Mariko must be out in the limousine because she saw no one exit the limousine. She tracked it all the way from uh, Mariko's apartment building to the meeting. So out she goes, even as Yukio tackles in these uh, horizontal panels, a la Frank Miller, uh, Silver Samurai. Great fight choreography by Paul Smith. And let's continue here. Yeah, so we've got these, a tier of horizontal panels. We're going to see a lot more of that in the next issue as well. And Silver Samurai starts to get a little bit of the better of Yukio. Um, and she thinks he's coming very close. I'd better be careful. Uh, she uh, flips away from a strike of his sword. So Viper's outside and uh, she notices a fog. I've never known one to rise so suddenly. The night was clear when we arrived. It's so thick I can barely see the car. So, you know, long-time readers of Uncanny X-Men know a speciality of uh, storms is creating a fog. And who is in the car? This is hardly Mariko uh, sending a gust of wind to blow Viper away from the door and into the side of the warehouse building. And of course, it's Storm stepping out of the driver's seat. The gambit was Yukio's and is thus far proving most successful. But Viper's unconscious, so Storm tells uh, Yukio to leave, or sorry, Mariko to leave immediately. And Mariko asks after Storm and Yukio, and she says, We shall be fine. This is our sort of work. Use the car telephone to summon the police, as Yukio did me. So that's why Storm is there. Yukio rang uh, the uh, Mariko's apartment and called for Storm. That's pretty nice. Uh, Tight plotting by Claremont. I like these silhouettes of Mariko and Storm and then the car and the uh, dock and Storm aloft in the air. So she arrives into the warehouse as Yukio is dodging Silver Samurai and she sends out um, a, lightning, a lightning bolt. She thinks here, physically I'm no match for the samurai. If I'm to save Yukio, I must risk summoning my lightning, but that's indoor. And then she loses control of the lightning. And so we get this dramatic uh, uh, situation here as the arbitrator. But we're going to learn in issues time that this guy is not who he appears to be. Thinks here, splendid. Mutants, you have done precisely what I expected of you. My trap is sprung, your fate sealed. So Storm loses control over the uh, lightning bolts. She's afraid of electrocuting Sa um, Silver Samurai to death. So she draws, attempts to draw the bolts back into herself. And we can see uh, the, uh, the, the pain and violence of that in this vertical panel here. And it looks like she's burning her flesh Yukio thinks what is happening to her. So she acts quickly, throws uh, her coat over Storm, 
and uh, bounces out of the warehouse window and luckily they're over water just as uh, the ex explosives and fireworks in the warehouse catch fire and the whole place goes up in flames. Nicely choreographed here the action by Paul Smith, really nicely done. And let's continue. So they drop into the water, uh, storm uh, surfaces first. She's worried about uh, Yukio, where is she? But she's alive. And then they look back at the warehouse on, f on fire. And what do they see? Except unexpectedly, the Phoenix Force, Firebird, and what does that portend? And Storm thinks it cannot be, I was hallucinating. What I saw could not exist. Uh, she says, the X-Men believe, thinks to herself, the X-Men believed Phoenix destroyed long ago, but can an entity such as she truly die? And she thinks that because Yukio sees it, so it's clearly not an hallucination. And she continues to think, does this manifestation mean she has somehow restored herself. So a mystery for another day, but we will get to the bottom of it and what's going on in subsequent issues. And here we get more of this characterization of Storm or Storm's ongoing developing characterization where she, uh, envy, where she says she envies Yukio's madness. It is a luxury denied me ever since my powers first appeared. My safety and that of those around me requires an inner serenity an absolute harmony with the world, with life itself, I've lately lost. Is that why things went crazy in the warehouse? And Storm replies, I hope so, for the death of my soul is infinitely preferable to the alternative. And inside we see the silhouette and the flames of Silver Samurai. He's survived the explosion. And he says here, the wind witch and the wild one did their worst, yet through some miracle I survived. But what are Viper and Nabatone-san? Nabatone Viper's alive on the edge of the dock, unconscious. So he says here, Viper's fabled look still holds. But he basically vows that when, he, when he's finished with his half-sister, Mariko, it'll be Storm's turn to die. So here we have Storm and Yukio still recovering with Nabatone in the background. And Storm thinks, what was that? I thought I heard laughter. Have I lost my wits as well to believe the winds themselves mock me that the very night air has turned evil? Where are we going, Yukio? She asks. We must warn the others of what we saw. But Yukio says they need a place to rest up. And then the scene switches to hospitals and it's Wolverine's first person narration. And he says he hates hospitals. He's seen too much of them. The others are critical. If they survive the night, they'll pull through. The doc says it's a big if. I can't wait. My body started healing itself the instant I swallowed Viper's poison. I'm sick as a dog, but I'm on my feet. So Wolverine's healing factor back in this era, 1983, it's not, um, you know, in, it's not uh, supercharged. Uh, like he does feel the ill effects of something like poisoning, but his healing factor will ultimately deal with it. But he's somewhat um, weakened by uh, the recovery, speeded up compared to everyone else from the poison. Nice tier of horizontal panels here. We have the uh, outdoors of the hospital room with uh, Mariko's uh, secret, or secret Service agents assigned to Mariko for her protection and that of the X-Men. Lockheed here up on a ledge, that's a nice little detail. The X-Men here, that's obviously Colossus in a bed here. And Wolverine is out of his bed. And um, he says that the security service people will look after you and the X-Men while I'm gone to Mariko. She protests, but he says if the samurai isn't stopped, he'll try again. More innocent people might be hurt. You want that? Besides Miko, my love, how are you going to stop me? Nice screen tone here in the background as well. And then we've got Rogue. She's up and about and she insists that she's coming too. And his response is, Kurt, the heck you are? And she says that she's an X-Man. Xavier said so. Work with him then, kiddo, not me. How am I supposed to prove myself if none of you will give me the chance, huh? What about the poison? And she says, I'm half alien, remember? That's because of absorbing uh, Miss Marvel's powers permanently. Uh, it wasn't so effective on me, she says. 
with her hand on her hip, her fist on her hip there, considering our condition and what's at stake, you need a backup. Makes sense, much as I wish it didn't. But you follow my lead, youngster, my orders, every flame and step of the way. So he's got his mask on and they're ready to roll. And the, uh, the declaration of the uh, upcoming next issue is tag, you are dead. So action awaits. Nice little screen tone here on the uh, wall in the background. Great stuff, fantastic art, story, tightly plotted, great characterization bits, great combination of art and color as well. And I love the panel layouts and designs um, imitating those of Frank Miller in the Wolverine miniseries. D little detail here, apparently there hadn't been a letters page for quite a while, so this is the return of the letters page. And the gimmick here is that uh, the letters are answered by Kitty Pride. So you can have a look at that if you want um, in your own time. And there you go. So I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary of this excellent issue, Uncanny X-Men 172. A little note at the end is this is a celebratory review. It's the first birthday of the channel. My first uh, video review was on the 2nd of July, 2022. So this is 2023. And I wanna thank all of you, all of the subscribers for your support and comments and likes uh, over the year. And here's to another year and many more years to come. So I do hope that you enjoy this video. Please like it on YouTube if you did. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.